uh, go ahead and begin. Thanks everyone for being here. We're really excited about this topic that we're talking about. And um, as you may know, we uh, did this earlier today in the morning, East Coast time, and really had a great experience. So uh, looking forward to another good time with you today. And uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ross, who's gonna talk us through kind of the agenda and kick us off. Great. Thanks, David. Are you guys seeing my slides? Yes. All right. I'm Ross Strader. We'll uh, go ahead and get going here. Uh, today, what we're going to do, uh, we'll talk just for a couple minutes about what we mean by interactivity. Uh, say a few words about why interactivity is important. Uh, I'll kick it back to David. He's going to talk about some of the analytics that we uh, have been working on that uh, help point us to places where interactivity would be uh, the most useful for students. Uh, and then I'll take back over and we'll talk some about H5P, which is a really neat tool that we're going to use to create some interactive activities. So what is interactivity? Well, an obvious definition is that it's something that allows students to interact with the material. Uh, I think the important distinction there is uh, you know, reading and video are all good to introduce a concept, but uh, those of you who teach uh, know that we can lecture at students all day long, but it's not until they start you know, really doing the homework and engaging with the material, that's when it starts to stick in, in their brain. Uh, so interactivity is an opportunity to have the students learn by doing, which is a lot of what the learning science says we should be doing in education. It gives students a chance to practice the concept uh, that they're learning. It provides an opportunity for application. So, uh, you know, instead of just uh, having questions and have them recall things that they've read, uh, give them a scenario in an interactive activity and, and let them kind of work through that scenario and apply the concept as opposed to just recall it. It adds meaning and interest to content. You know, having a point of engagement is, uh, well, engaging and motivating. Uh, and so there's a benefit there. And then finally, and, and uh, I kind of think this is the most important one, it's an opportunity to provide feedback. So again, as the students are learning the material, one of the big advantages in my mind of the new digital coursewares that we have, maybe I won't say new anymore, uh, online courses, digital courseware, digital tools, is the opportunity to provide feedback to students who are going through this in real time as they're learning a concept. Um, and so uh, I, I would almost even be happy with this definition, that an interactive, interactive activity is something that provides uh, real-time feedback to the student as they're learning a concept. Why is this important? Who cares? Well, I talked a little bit about this already, but uh, this is a great book for those of you who haven't seen it yet, How Learning Works. Susan Ambrose and some of her colleagues I came out of Carnegie Mellon University a few years ago. And uh, this book gives seven, uh, it kind of pulls from the research to give seven principles for, uh, for how, to, how to teach, how to, how to build a class. And one of the principles, in fact, is, is, is this, goal-directed practice coupled with targeted feedback are critical to learning. Um, if we, uh, as, as we sometimes tend to do, ignore all the learning science uh, and want to prove it again to ourselves, the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University uh, released a paper a few years ago uh, talking about the doer effect. So there's the title of the paper. I will cut to the chase for you. They looked across a number of different courses and over 10,000 students and found that the, uh, the learning effect for the students that actually did the interactive activities was about six times greater uh, than for those that just read the content or watched the videos. So good stuff here. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to David. He'll talk a little bit about how do we figure out, you know, if we're bought into the idea of interactivity, how do we figure out where it would be uh, most useful to students? So let me stop sharing. Or did I stop sharing? Did you take over, David? I took over. I just took over at the same point that you stopped. Great. So. Perfect. Thanks. On your screen now. So interactivity is um, super important, super useful for students to have opportunities to practice and get feedback and understand what they are getting and what they're not getting. But it's uh, obviously more time intensive, more resource intensive to build interactives than it is to uh, write a paragraph of words. So uh, it can be, from a practical perspective, really important to think about where are we going to spend uh, the time and effort to add interactivity. And so that's what we want to talk about for a minute. 
And when we talk about where um, and this idea of a place in a course, it really helps if we have a sense of what's in the course, what's there, and how it's structured. And that really, uh, for me and for us at Lumen at least, all comes back to outcome alignment. Um, this idea that the outcome is the at the center of everything that's going on and that the content, that practice opportunities, formative assessment, summative assessment are all outcome aligned. And that's particularly important uh, in a case like this where you have a, a one or more summative assessment items that students attempt and say they fail at those assessment items. So we know that they don't understand something that's going on because they've missed this bundle, bundle of assessment items. What should we do? Well, if those assessment items are outcome aligned and the content in the course is outcome aligned, then we can chase back from their failure on that summative assessment item to the outcome alignment and find the resources and the practice or formative assessment that should have given them an opportunity uh, to succeed there. Um, so RISE analysis is a technique that uh, two of my grad students and I developed and published a couple of years ago. This is an open access uh, peer-reviewed journal article that if you search for Bob Lee Nyland and Wiley, you can find on RISE analysis. And the idea of RISE analysis is to uh, provide a very quick way for helping us answer this question of which outcomes are students struggling on the most. Um, and with a specific eye toward looking at where's the content really not pulling its weight or doing its job in supporting student learning. And so the, the way to think about that or the way that we thought about it and described it in this paper is in kind of a two by two matrix where the horizontal is a learner engagement with content and the vertical axis is learner performance on uh, aligned assessments. And so these two green boxes that go kind of up and to the right, that's the default uh, kind of what we would expect when students are engaging with the content, uh, either not very much or maybe not at all. They're not reading, they're not watching, they're not practicing we would assume that their performance on the aligned assessments would also be pretty poor. And likewise, when students are in there studying, they're doing the reading, they're doing the practice, they're redoing the practice, they're watching the videos again. Uh, when they're really engaged with the content, we would expect that their performance on the aligned assessments would be high. So those two green boxes represent kind of a default hypothesis. But this down and to the right, is really kind of problematic. And particularly this red box down at the bottom right hand corner, which represents places where students are really highly engaged with the content. They're reading more uh, than they've read on average. They're doing the practice more than they've done on average. Uh, and yet they're still performing very poorly on the aligned assessments, even though they're highly engaged with the content. That seems like a place where we can go in and look and see uh, maybe some real return on our investment in time and resources from improving content and particularly creating interactives that provide students with immediate feedback. So uh, I'm going to leave this on the screen for a minute, uh, this URL lumenlearning.com slash improving learning. Um, if you've got a web browser and you'd like to follow me there, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Otherwise, after I pause for a moment or two, I'm going to uh, jump over there myself in my own tab. And I just want to show you what this RISE analysis looks like. So lumenlearning.com slash improving learning will bring you to this page where we uh, have, have published and continue to publish information about our continuous improvement efforts. And there's a lot of material on this page that you can read about what we're doing, but what we're looking for right now for our purposes is under a great how do I begin, number one, visit the community-based continuous improvement site. And if I click there, that's gonna take us into a Google Drive. And in this Google Drive, there are folders representing several of the courses that uh, Loon supports with OER. I'll drop into biology for majors here as an example. And what you'll see here is a list of pages with one titled, Start Here, Review the RISE Analysis. So if I drop in to start here, review the RISE analysis, what you will see um, is I'll show you the visualization first. Uh, this visualization shows of what we were just looking at a minute ago. This is content engagement on the horizontal and performance on aligned assessments on the vertical. And every dot here represents a single learning outcome uh, in this course. 
And so you can see these two black, solid black lines intersecting at zero, zero. That's the average amount of content engagement and the average performance on aligned assessments. So everything down in that bottom right hand corner where the numbered red dots are, those will be places where students are more engaged than average with the content, but underperforming relative to their average on assessments. And so we get a sense here for what these points are, where they are, what they look like, how far away from average they are. And we can see that numbers one and two are pretty far away from the average in terms of how much engagement there is with the content and how, how poorly students are performing. That same information is presented here in a table uh, with the top outcome here being outcome number one in that graph down below. Um, and you can just see here for all of the outcomes in this course, uh, for all of the students who used this course last semester, what they struggled with and how they struggled relative to, uh, you know, on some outcomes relative to others. So here I might say, oh gosh, explain how relationships are indicated. This is an outcome that I know a lot about and I feel like I have a, I have a sense for how I could probably improve the content there. I wonder what the content actually looks like. If I return to this folder here, I see outcome two explain how the relationships are indicated. If I double click that and open it up, it will bring me to a Google Doc that provides me with two things. First, a little bit of scaffolding around how to contribute uh, to making this content better. And then below that, all of the content from the courseware uh, that is aligned with this specific outcome that's supposed to support student learning there. And as you'll see, if you take a look through this uh, kind of framework here at the top, this it recommends doing everything from just sharing your thoughts, leaving a comment, maybe adding a comment that says, hey, I can tell you why this isn't working or I have an idea. And if you don't know how to leave a comment in a Google Doc, there's a video tutorial to show you how to do that. All the way down through, you know, recommending other OER that could be used here to making small edits directly in the material or actually just cloning this page and kind of going to town in terms of doing major reworking there. Uh, but this is the kind of material that we're pulling together and the support that we're providing for continuous improvement. And particularly, I wanted to give you a view into uh, that RISE framework report and what that looked like. So as we go forward and talk about where might we spend some time creating interactives, the list of outcomes listed in that Google Drive is a great place to look for outcomes that students are doing poorly on that where some time invested there can be really helpful. So I'll turn it back to Ross to talk a little bit about uh, how we add interactive. Great. Thanks, David. All right. So uh, this is a part I'm really excited about. Uh, I, I've been, this has been a passion of mine throughout my career. And back when I was uh, creating interactive activities, say 15 years ago, uh, this is what it took, right? Some of you might have been doing that uh, at the time as well. It's HTML and JavaScript and CSS. It's a lot of code uh, to make things work. And then along came this icon you might recognize, it's Flash. And that solved some of the cross-browser compatibility problems we had before. And, and uh, there was a nice IDE, so it's kind of a step forward. Still a little bit uh, you know, too in-depth for somebody who isn't uh, interested in doing some coding. Um, but you know, a little bit better than having to just do straight coding at least. But then, of course, Flash went away, and uh, what, about five or six years ago, uh, six or seven years ago, we were kind of back to this for a while, uh, having to, to know how to code in order to make something interactive. However, things are changing, and I'm very excited. Uh, we now have uh, tools like H5P, and this actually started because of that problem I just mentioned. Uh, these guys were facing the same problem that a lot of the rest of us were. They had lots of content that was uh, created in Flash, uh, and no real path forward for delivering it. So I had to uh, find a way to be able to create interactive activities um, without Flash. They built a nice set of authoring tools that make it pretty easy for anybody to kind of dive in and make something good without a whole lot of time investment. It, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, when I looked at it a couple of years ago, it, it looked great, but uh, the activities weren't, uh, didn't necessarily meet uh, the accessibility guidelines, and so it was kind of a non-starter for us. 
Um, but again, lots of people start looking at this and contributing to it. It's an open source project. And so now they make great strides there and not everything, but a large percentage of their activities are accessible. Um, so good stuff. We're going to be using that today uh, to actually create an interactive. But before we dive in there, let me flip over and show a few examples. Um, so this is an example from our psychology course here at Lumen. It's about reliability and validity. And I'm going to be showing a specific um, H5P activity type. It's called course presentation. And I like it because it, it gives the ability to have these different slides that you see down here at the bottom. Um, so we can present a cover story and then ask students questions on it and kind of achieve some of the pedagogical goals I was referring to earlier. So in this case, you know, students uh, often get reliability and validity confused. And this gives the cover story here is talking about a, uh, you have a new scale and the scale is reliable if it gives you the same weight every time. It's valid if that weight is, is your act, actual weight. Uh, so you can imagine that it could be off. It could be reliable in that, you know, if I weigh uh, 180 pounds uh, and it, it gives me 170 every time I step on it, it's reliable. It's not valid though, uh, vice versa. Uh, you know, if it's not, if it's not reliable, it could give me a different weight every time. And then that's, uh, that's also a problem. So let's dive right in and ask a question. Uh, you find a new scale and take it home. You weigh yourself several times and notice that while it gives you the same result every time, it's reporting your weight almost 10 pounds lower than you're used to seeing. I kind of gave this one away just now, didn't I? So is this a problem with reliability or validity? Uh, let me get this one wrong. So that's a problem with validity. Uh, let me say that it's reliability and we get the feedback that says that's incorrect. Since it gives the same result every time, we do consider it to be reliable. It's not valid since it's not accurately measuring my weight. Okay, so again, this kind of targeted feedback that we get the students right as they're learning these concepts and making these mistakes is super valuable. Um, I can retry this and this time I will Whoops, which one? I'm, I'm confusing myself here. 10 pounds lower, so yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it, H5P reorders the answer choices, so you actually have to, you can't just pick the other one, you actually have to uh, read the problem again. So now I get that correct, and again, uh, we get feedback. The scale is reliable since it gives the same result every time, but it's not valid since it doesn't accurately measure your weight. Now, why bother giving feedback there? I mean, the student got the answer right. Well, you can imagine that, you know, these are novice learners who are going through here. Um, I might have guessed. I really have no idea here. And so giving uh, feedback on the correct answer is really valuable. Uh, this question only has two options. You can imagine in a, a question with four answer options that, you know, maybe I narrow it down to two and I think this one's right. Okay, I got it right, but you know, why isn't this other one right? And I click over there. So having this feedback for incorrect and correct answer options is, uh, is, is super valuable. Then we go on to, here's another, some more text that they read there and another uh, question, another, another check. And I think there's a final one here as well. So three opportunities for practice there. That's psychology. Let me show you another one. This is in uh, an organizational behavior course. This has two companies that are merging, and I think the cover story is that one of them has had a commission-only model, while the other one has salaried sales staff. So what's going to happen when they merge? Nobody's going to be happy about that, right? We continue with the cover story here, and then the same idea. So there's a conflict here. What's the best way for management to look at this uh, conflict? And I think this is a wrong answer. So yep, that's incorrect, and again, gives you some good targeted feedback there. And it's the same idea. So uh, there's an additional wrinkle. Here's a new problem. You know, what do you think is going to happen here? I should say also that um, these types of questions that we can ask here in, in these interactive activities are different than the ones that we would come up with, say, for a quiz, where uh, the purpose of a quiz pedagogically is really to assess student mastery. Like, did they get this? Uh, let's prove it. You know, for a quiz, it's for faculty. For a self-check, it's the attempt to, or the opportunity for a student to prove it to themselves. Uh, with these kinds of practice questions, these interactive activities, uh, it's really, again, the students are learning by doing. So it's fine to say, okay, you read a couple paragraphs on this concept. Here's a scenario. What do you think might happen? You know, take a stab. Uh, you're not necessarily supposed to have mastered it yet, um, but you pick an answer and you get feedback, whether you're right or wrong, that helps you learn the material. 
Let me show a couple of other examples just quickly. I think work examples are always good to see in my experience. This is from our one of our econ courses, macroeconomics. Um, and this one, uh, we reuse OER wherever possible. In this course, uh, we pulled OER from OpenStax. Uh, they have a great econ text. Um, but the graph, there was a graph on this page in the original text that was this graph. I'll flip to the end now just to kind of show you the final product here. This was the, the graph in the original text. And I'm not an economist. I'm an engineer. Um, so uh, graphs and math don't uh, scare me the way that uh, I think some students uh, Kind of get nervous around graphs and, and math. Um, but still, even as somebody who's comfortable with graphs, there's a lot going on there, right? I'm not sure where I would start parsing that. So what we've done is we've taken that graph and pared it down to where it's just the supply and demand curve. So at this point in the course, you know, I, I should have mastered that. We've had a lot of content on supply and demand, equilibrium points. And we start there and say, okay, uh, here's the supply and demand curves. There's a cover story. I think there's a, this is about rent control and popularity of a town and what ends up happening is that uh, that's going to cause the demand curve to shift to the right. I'll get that one right. See, I have learned something about economics as I've gone along. Uh, we go forward to the next slide. Okay, there's that new demand curve. We've drawn that in. All right, what happens when we add a price ceiling? We go in here, now there's a price ceiling. Okay, again, another opportunity for the student to engage. What do you think is going to happen with that price ceiling? Now I'll take a stab here. I don't remember the answer, so that's incorrect. Uh, and then finally, Again, uh, on that last page, here's the completed graph. I think the, the main point here is that uh, delta they have there representing the excess demand or shortage from the price ceiling. So I love this one. We've been able to build this graph up over time, kind of walking the student through each step in the process. So it's not so overwhelming when they see this. And finally, let me show one more quickly. This is from uh, the Introduction to Business course. It's about absolute and comparative advantage. Uh, and here we have two countries, uh, orange and green are the names of the two countries. And we're going to look at absolute comparative advantage to maximize the total amount of production for the both for both countries. So again, same thing. We have a cover story. We flip through. Uh, we come to questions uh, that we ask the student along the way to, again, let them engage with the content, provide feedback as we go. So just some uh, examples there I wanted to show you to maybe give you ideas. Now let's dive into H5P itself. And I'll actually show how to build one of these. So I have, um, I have a, a kind of a cheat sheet. It's a Google Doc that has some screenshots of how you go in and uh, create an account and do some of this. So I will share that at the end. But uh, for now, let me, I'm gonna skip over the part where you make an account. It's pretty straightforward, but you see I'm already logged in here. Uh, and again, it shows you how to do that in the document that I will, I will share in just a minute. Uh, but let me quickly run through what it looks like to actually get into edit mode and make one of these. So again, the Google Doc tells you how to get to this point. When you do, the kinds of interactives I've been showing are, are uh, the one they call a course presentation. So I'll click onto that. It takes a minute to load here. And now I'm in the editing mode uh, for my interactive. So just for fun, uh, what I'm going to do is go back to that psychology example. Let's actually build this one up just so you can kind of see how this works. I'll be flipping back and forth. I'm gonna move this tab over here between these two and we'll, we'll recreate that one. So uh, you enter a title for this activity. Let's say reliability and validity. And one thing I'm gonna make sure and show is uh, how you uh, enter the attributions here for the content that you'll be using. So there's a metadata field right here near the title. It's, uh, if you don't notice that, then there's nothing else that points you to it. So I find this is easy to miss. I wanted to highlight that. And what that does is it lets me assign a license to my content. You'll be doing this today for the interactives that you'll create. So I'll choose CC BY, 4.0 is fine. By default, it has my username. So I'm gonna put in Luma Learning. And I can choose save author there if I want to enter another author or just go ahead and save the metadata. Okay, so I've entered my, my licensing information there. I'll show you in just a minute where that uh, is visible in the end product. All right, so uh, there's a series of buttons across the top here. And this again, this is pretty user friendly. I can click on any of these and it lets me enter you know, text or load an image. All right, so let me grab the text for this first one. 
and I'll paste it in here. And there's some different kinds of, you know, uh, it's a WYSIWYG editor. You can do some formatting here if you want. And I'll hit done. And I can move this guy around. So I think in the, I think I can move him around. There we go. I think we had this one across the top. Whoops. In the original activity. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I wanted to edit again. All right. Um, we can add an image. So I will go and let's see. I think I. And one of these, uh, I'm not sure if I downloaded that already. So let me just show you the, the image screen. We'll pretend like we're gonna add an image. That's what you do. You can choose that from your computer. Um, but again, I wanted to highlight the metadata field here. So that lets me add in the title of an image. Um, actually, you know what, I think, here, I pulled it up over here. This was the bathroom scale image. So let me go ahead and do this. Save as. Try this one more time. Oh, I'm not getting it. Ah, so <laughs> let me just go back and I'll show you the metadata. Uh, so this is how I'd add in the licensing information for that image. So the image that uh, I'm not gonna spend time actually uploading is from Flickr. And this is the licensing on it. It's a CC BY 2.0 license. And let's see, I think that the title of the image was here. So I would go back here and enter that and then choose CC BY 2.0. And then the author's name, I think was Your Best Digs. So I go back here. and then save the metadata. And you can add in alt text, I mentioned accessibility, so uh, that's obviously good to do for all of the images that you're adding. And then finally go down here and click done. It's probably complaining, oh, how about that? It has a default image for me. Great. And we can resize that and you can protect users from themselves. I love it. Okay, and then finally, there was another text block over here I have the text that goes in that one. Okay, and we will let's see, we will move this one over and resize. Great. So that's that intro screen. Uh, and again, I'll show you the, the attributions in just a minute. That's the first slide here, if you remember from the original activity. Uh, the second slide is where we ask them that first question. So let me demo that as well. To add another slide, I can do one of a couple things. Here's a new slide button. Uh, I can also clone this slide. And sometimes if your if the formatting is gonna be similar, then uh, that's a nice option. Uh, let me just go ahead and add a new slide in here. I'll get a blank one. And so this again is where we have this multiple choice question. Let me flip back to our activity and that is right here. So I'll click on that. This opens up a new screen. Okay. Um, and then the question system is this. My available options in this case, again, are liability. Uh, what was the correct answer to this one? Reporting your weight almost 10 pounds lower. So this was a problem with validity, right? Yeah. Okay, so reliability is not the correct answer, so I won't check that. However, I definitely want to provide targeted feedback here. So that's under message displayed if the answer is selected. And what we're going to say for that is incorrect and give some feedback about reliability and validity. And then I go down, enter my other answer option, which was validity. This time that is the correct answer, so I'll check that box. And again, make sure to enter my feedback here. Again, that's part of the, uh, the key to this. Okay. 
and finally click done. Okay. And this always uh, comes in super small, so you need to drag it around and resize it. You'll see that scroll bar on the right. I want to make that disappear, but I also, I don't want to make it just barely disappear like that. You'll see it goes away there. I want to give some more room because we had that feedback in there. Uh, that way, when the student clicks on that, it actually expands and makes room for the feedback without having a uh, scroll bar pop up. So there we go. Now, uh, let's pretend like I'm done. I don't want to add any more screens. I'll go down here and click Save. And then this next part is uh, a little bit less intuitive, I find. So I always want to point this out to people. Sometimes it takes a minute to figure out what's going on here. When you click Save, it doesn't just save it. It pops you into this view mode here. It's the view and edit tabs that I think uh, could be highlighted a little bit more in the interface. People tend to miss those, I find. So we're in view mode here. This lets me view my interactive as a student would. Um, if I want to get back to authoring, then I would just click edit. And that takes me right back to where we just were. I can make changes here to my existing content. I can add in new slides. Um, and then again, I would just come back and choose save again. And then that pops me right back in the view mode, which is useful to be able to test it. It's nice to, uh, to see it as a student would see it. So there's our first slide and our second slide. We can choose our answers and get our good feedback there. All right. Now, one other thing to point out is these three links down below. Uh, reuse gives me the ability to download this as a, as a .h5p file. It's, it's essentially just a zip file. So this is how you can download it from h5p.org and uh, send it to us. We can embed it in a course. We will host it ourselves. One distinction there, h5p.org is a site that they provide for uh, letting you kind of try out the authoring tools. It's not a place to host your activities. So you want to send that to us and we can host that for you. And then I wanted to show the rights of use. So this is where the attributions I was entering show up here. So there's the kind of overall uh, attribution for the interactive activity as a whole. And then it'll have a section for each slide with the uh, image. And there's the attribution information that I entered for that, <laughs> the image that I didn't actually upload. Uh, and then finally, embed is also nice. Um, that lets you, if you wanted to put this on another website, that just gives you an iframe tag that is helpfully highlighted there. You can grab that and copy it and paste it into any, any web page and that'll show up. Again, uh, that is a little bit, h5p.org, they don't really want you linking to their site. Uh, so it's a little bit odd that that's offered, but uh, uh, with, with fair warning, you could go down at any time, but you are able to embed it in a web page here. So having said that, let me go back to my slides here. And I think the next step is, uh, David's gonna talk a little bit more about uh, how you guys are gonna go off and make your own interactive. This is the uh, cheat sheet I mentioned. So I'll give you a minute to copy that, or maybe Rachel, we could put that in the, uh, the, the chat there. Uh, this is the Google Doc that walks you through with some screenshots, everything I just showed. Uh, and in addition, it shows you how to set up an account, which is the first step that you wanna do. So, David, I will stop sharing and kick it back over to you. Thank you. And I just dropped that link in the chat. Um, so if you weren't able to grab it, you can uh, click on it right in the chat. It should take you there. So I want to talk, um, just to wrap up this kind of presentation part uh, of the hackathon, I want to talk about recognition for a minute. Two kinds of recognition that you can earn for participating in the webinar. The first is a certificate of participation. And I'll show a little more detail about that, and in particular, the rubric. Um, essentially, to earn a certificate of participation for uh, taking part in the webinar, you just have to create an interactive and share it. But more interesting uh, in some ways is this tenure and promotion letter. Um, and you may have seen this draft before. This is something that we've been working on. And the idea here is that if you create an interactive uh, that ends up getting incorporated into one of the courses that Lumen supports, and you're interested in this kind of documentation, it's kind of an altmetrics sort of view of the use that your interactive is getting. So it would contain information like the number of students who have been assigned the courseware that your interactive is a part of as their official course materials, uh, in addition to the number of students who, uh, or number of people just generally who had seen uh, your interactive as it's hosted 
in our uh, public facing open catalog of OER that had over 43 million views last year. So it's just a way for us to provide as a third party, provide you with some information about the impact and the use that your work has had uh, so that hopefully your tenure and promotion committee can look at that and uh, say, well, that's something that we understand and know how to value. So what we want to do now is spend the rest of our time. We've got about two and a half hours left of what's blocked out. Um, inviting you to create an interactive. So the first step here, of course, is deciding what topic to create an interactive about. And so I'd encourage you to go back and look uh, through the uh, RISE analysis data, see if there's something there that is a course that you teach or that you have some uh, disciplinary expertise in that you, where you can create an interactive there. And if there's not any analysis, uh, any RISE analysis for a course that you teach, just pick an outcome based on your own experience of what students have struggled with. Um, so once you pick a topic to create an interactive about, create that interactive and then share it. Um, and I will drop this link in the chat as well. Um, this is the link to the Google Doc where we're having people share the interactives that they're creating. And I'll just take a second and type that in here. And then I'll show you what that looks like. All right. And you can just click on that directly from the chat and it will take you to this page. And if you uh, scroll down, you can see the West Coast cohort here is blank. But if you scroll down, you can see the things that were created by people uh, in the East Coast cohort this morning. Uh, and basically all you need to do is um, provide your name, the link to the interactive that you created, and the link to some OER that you would use that interactive with. Uh, I've provided the link, both the short link and the long link to the H5P tutorial that uh, Ross had mentioned a minute ago. And then here, let me uh, just talk you through the very short rubric for earning the certificate of participation. So you need to create an interactive using H5P. You need to include distractor specific feedback for the questions in your interactive. And that feedback should not say, uh, you know, go review the course materials. Uh, the feedback should actually contain uh, the, the coaching and the information that students need to correct whatever misunderstanding uh, they had when they clicked on the wrong answer. Uh, be sure to openly license your interactive using that metadata tag right next to the title. And then once you've done those things, come back here and jump into this blank area below the West Coast cohort, and you can share the interactive that you've created. And you know, having done this, I think we had about 15 people create interactives this morning. I'll say the places where people got hung up were either uh, forgetting to include feedback or including feedback that was not particularly useful, like go review the course material, uh, or forgetting to provide the open licensing in their interactive. So if you keep those things in mind um, and create an interactive and come back and share it here again, just like in this example, name, link to the interactive. And this link to the interactive, uh, you'll find as you're editing in H5P, that's just the address that's up in the address bar. Um, so you can do that there. And so for the next little bit, Ross and I are going to hang out here and we'll be available to answer any questions that you have. If you get stuck, if you can't remember how to say add the open license and you can't find it in the tutorial or whatever question you might have, um, uh, one of us will be here and able to answer your question and try to get you to the point where before you jump off, um, you've done everything you need to do to at least earn that certificate of participation. Uh, Ross, anything you want to add before we kind of say go to it and start creating? Oh, just one thing that uh, jumped to mind. Uh, it is sometimes hard to think of good feedback. And so one uh, tip or trick that I find helpful is uh, think about what you would say to a student in your office hours who made that mistake or, or you know, gave that answer. Um, you know, sometimes the answer options that we come up with seem kind of ridiculous to us. Like, how could you possibly think that's the answer? But if the student chose it, ostensibly, that's where they are. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, while uh, David's right that, you know, go review the material or give up and drop the course is not the best feedback. 
uh, you know, if somebody really is struggling that much, then oftentimes uh, good feedback is just to kind of remind them of what we're doing and kind of get them refocused on the task at hand. So to kind of guide them back towards where they need to be. So I find it useful to think about what I would say to a student in person in my office hours. So that was all. Yeah, that's great advice. So if you do have a question, feel free to either drop it in the chat or you can unmute your mic and just ask. And um, we'll just be watching uh, as things plug in here. And as you drop in the link, we'll hop over uh, and look at your interactive and check to make sure that you remembered to add an open license and that you added feedback and things like that. And um, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's a little awkward at this point because normally we would say, okay, thanks for joining the webinar and we'd sign off. But now we're gonna say, thanks for kind of putting up with uh, the little bit of presenting that we wanted to do to set some context. And now you can go make interactives and as you have questions, we'll just be here to answer them. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all for taking the time to, to come in and we're excited to see what you're gonna build now. <laughs>